A woman wakes up on a bright sunny morning in Midland, Texas. It's her day off, and she decides she's going to use the time to take care of all the lingering errands she'd been putting off for far too long. She gets dressed, washes her hair, and prepares to pour herself a nice bowl of cereal. But when she opens the refrigerator, she finds… there's no milk. She'll need to see to that immediately. She steps out of her front door and notices a paper on her doormat. She bends down to pick up the pamphlet, which advertises a new supermarket opening in town. And what do you know, there's a coupon for milk attached. What a stroke of good luck! The woman makes her way into town, eager to check out the new grocery store. She parks her car and approaches the building, when suddenly, a stranger is standing right in front of her, carrying a plate of what appear to be free samples. He's dressed like a supermarket employee, but he's built like a soldier, complete with a military crew cut. He smiles and tells her that he actually works for a rival store and points at a building across the street. He's positive that whatever she thinks she can get at this store, she can instead get at the one across the street for a lower cost and higher quality. She can't help but notice the almost unsettling desperation in the salesman's face. Something about his spiel makes her feel like she's in danger. She politely declines his offer, but he continues pitching deals and bargains at her as she makes her way into the safety of the new supermarket. The clean tiles below and the buzzing fluorescent lights above seem so familiar, yet also strangely alien to her. Something about this place is just… wrong. But she needs the milk, so she walks down the aisles, deeper into the store. She hears strange noises and looks over her shoulder. Was the bread aisle always behind her? She could have sworn she just came out of the meat and fish section. Where did they even keep the milk in this place? Every so often there's a strange noise somewhere in the store around her. It sounds almost like footsteps, but not quite. More like claws tapping on the tiles. Is she alone in here? Come to think of it, she can't quite remember seeing anyone else since she came in. There's something so profoundly off about this place, but she just can't put her finger on what. She takes a step forward, and suddenly the floor gives way beneath her. The tiles separate with a whir of mechanized gears as a trap door opens up. In an instant, she's tumbling down into darkness. As she falls, she can see the white light beaming in from above illuminate the edge of something metal and razor sharp. In the store above, the sound of a scream can be heard, and a soft squish of metal piercing flesh, followed by the gurgle of blood, and then the trap door closes. A tinny voice over the PA system comes on and says, Clean up on aisle six? The woman is never seen again after that. What superficially appears to be an independent supermarket in Midland, Texas, actually contains a number of strange and often deadly paranormal secrets, and that doesn't even stop it from being a successful and popular supermarket. But the weirdest part of all? It's all perfectly legal, thank you very much. Welcome to Yeah, We're Totally Going to Sell You This, or as it's known to the SCP Foundation, SCP-4703. The primary anomalous effects surrounding SCP-4703 affect not its customers, but the very legality of its own existence and operations. The anomalies shift laws to make everything that goes on inside legal, no matter how unethical or dangerous. It also often reshapes laws to protect its own interests from outsiders, and anyone who breaks these laws may experience spontaneous attacks from violent animals, the most common of which are vicious lions. Here are a handful of the unethical and dangerous, yet perfectly legal, thank you very much, things that go on within the confines of SCP-4703. The stacks of shelves are mounted on powerful pneumatic actuators that seem to shift and spin of their own accord. While this has the intention of keeping the store varied and stopping customers from leaving, it more often causes serious injury with its sudden movements. Occasionally, these sets of shelves will collide, crushing whatever is stuck between them. If a child becomes lost or separated from their parents while they're inside the store, the child is forcibly detained and the parent or parents can only get their child back by either paying an upfront cost of $47.67 in cash or submitting to have their eyebrows permanently removed with laser follicle surgery. There are also several dozen hidden trap door mechanisms beneath the floor in various parts of the building, each one triggered by some strange and arbitrary condition, such as saying the word Wednesday or by not saying the word Wednesday. The triggers are updated each day and displayed on the store's website in several dead languages, including Latin, Koine Greek, Phoenician, and Punic. Each of these trap doors drops into deep shafts filled with some kind of hazard, such as spikes, glitter, or poisonous snakes. Yes, that's poisonous, not venomous. The snakes are only dangerous when eaten, but victims have reported that they seem incredibly appealing, which makes resisting them rather difficult. 
A section on the far side of the store is marked Starving for Savings and Discounts Ad Bestias, where all the products are fenced off and also marked down by 70% or more. However, the products are guarded by no less than 15 hungry lions. Store-branded fishing rods, telescopic grabbing mechanisms, and drones are available to rent for the explicit purpose of retrieving items remotely, although this will result in far higher costs, so you will have to brave the lions in order to attain those incredible deals. There's also a roughly 5% chance that, after checkout, your cashier will ask you to kiss them on the lips. If you refuse, they'll burn your purchases in front of you, and you won't receive a refund. If you do kiss them, there's a 1 in 3 chance that the cashier will have an anomalous toxin on their lips that will cause you to drop dead instantly. And every day, at an arbitrary time between the hours of 3 p.m. and closing time, the lions will be released from the discount section to roam the store, and only two checkout lines will remain open. All items will be free during this period, but they must be scanned one by one. The SCP Foundation is currently exploring links between SCP-4703 and two other anomalies like SCP-2030 and SCP-1459, the former being the cursed hidden camera show Laugh is Fun, and the latter being a nightmarish vending machine that murders puppies and dispenses a variety of cookies in exchange. So then, if it is so dangerous, why doesn't the SCP Foundation simply block access to yeah, we're totally going to sell you this? Unfortunately, thanks to the anomalous legal effect created by SCP-4703, the Foundation can't just storm in or physically contain the building, so instead, they attempt to divert as many customers away from 4703 as possible. To do this, the Foundation has started a rival supermarket across the street, named Super Competitive Prices LLC. Sheldon M. Katz Esquire is an SCP Foundation lawyer and bureaucromancer a thaumatologist skilled in the art of interfacing with anomalously bureaucratic SCPs, and he is spearheading the Foundation legal team's efforts into combating SCP-4703. Untangling the complex web of legality around SCP-4703 is a full-time job after all, and in the following memo, Mr. Katz did all he could to articulate the sheer enormity of the problem they're dealing with. He writes, Counteraction of SCP-4703's legal anomalies is a top-level priority for our department and we are making every effort to resolve the matter in a way which minimizes loss of life and economic detriment. We have received a significant number of inquiries regarding the mechanism of SCP-4703's indisputable legality. Unfortunately, there are no easy answers. Law is a human concept. It exists on paper because we write it down. It exists in practice because we enforce it. Generally, we interpret and exercise the law through the scrutiny of semantics, intent, and precedent. Yet, bureaucratic hazards such as SCP-4703 are not necessarily predicated on such things. In fact, the law as most know it has very little to do with the matter. While it's not a perfect comparison, one could say that baseline law is to anomalous law as arithmetic is to algebra. Both are recognized as mathematics, but the latter is more abstract. Imagine that Timmy and Sally each have two apples. If Timmy gives Sally his apples, then Sally should end up with four. But she doesn't. She has ten. How can this be? Sally recounts the apples and reenacts the scenario over and over, but there is no mistake. Two and two make ten. It is an incontrovertible fact. You see, even if anomalies are irrational, they are factual, and it is essential that one accepts this if they wish to develop a countervailing methodology. Once Sally accepts that her four apples have become ten, she reevaluates her radix and decides to recount the apples in base four. Suddenly, the ten apples are one zero apples. One zero is four in base four, which is the appropriate number of apples. Eureka! Sally collects another four apples, bringing the total to twenty, which is two zero, which is eight, which confirms that her new paradigm aligns with the abnormality. Form follows function according to the function of the form, and at last, everything makes sense. Except none of it does, really. A well-behaved reality oughtn't conflate the concrete with the abstract. If you initially perceived a countable sum of 10 apples in base 10, then the equivalent number of apples in base 4 should be 22, since it stands to reason that changing your subjective view of an outcome oughtn't alter the physical materials in the equation. However, we live in a very naughty reality which may, on a whim, allow a young girl to wield apples unbeholden to thermodynamics. This explanation is inadequate, of course, 
but hopefully it goes a small way toward helping you understand why the legal department is currently occupied with a comprehensive redrafting of Texas corporate law in a quaternary semiological system. This in itself would be an exceptional feat even for the most skilled of bureaucromancers, and it is further compounded by the necessary incorporation of contingency clauses against the self-aware fact patterns that keep legitimizing rabid lions into existence inside my goddamn bathroom. We are grateful to you, our valued colleagues, for your patience and cooperation as we work together toward a solution. The Foundation is currently conducting a three-pronged attack against the forces of SCP-4703, the first being the Super Competitive Prices LLC Competitive Store. The second is the tireless efforts of Mr. Katz and his team against the trifling legal issues of SCP-4703, and the third is outright infiltration and espionage. Of course, when you're going behind enemy lines, it's crucial that the proper operative is selected for the job. It can't just be anyone dropped into a high-pressure situation like this, especially considering the rapidly evolving nature of SCP-4703's conditions. The SCP Foundation was more than aware that they might only get one shot at getting one of their own in and out of the building. For this task, they selected Field Agent Felicity Blandina, codename Karen of Justice. Blandina was uniquely qualified for a job like this. In personality tests conducted on all Foundation agents to test loyalty, they consistently found Blandina to be one of the most obtuse and shameless agents on the Foundation payroll. During group lunches with other staff members, she has been reported numerous times sending meals back to the kitchen when she felt they were unsatisfactory. And Foundation cyber analysts have detected multiple posts on various social media networks made by her, directly tagging and criticizing brands that provided products or services she perceived as being subpar. While these qualities made her a terror to the customer service staff in her local area, they made her the ideal candidate for bypassing the bureaucratic stronghold of SCP-4703. If anyone could do it, it would be Field Agent Felicity Blandina. She was sent into the building with an expired coupon under the pretense of being an unhappy customer. She spoke to a sales assistant inside the store named Daniel Paulson, who explained to her that her coupon was denied because it was only applicable when the recipient submitted to ritual castration performed by the SCP-4703 staff. Seeing as Agent Blandina didn't have the necessary equipment to undergo such a procedure, Paulson generously offered to provide her with a free surgery to have the proper parts attached, though finding a suitable donor would likely take several months. Agent Blandina, following her well-trained Foundation directives, could not be assuaged by the bargain. Instead, she pressed on, first guilt-tripping him with sob stories about her children, then her lifelong struggles with astigmatism, and even threatening Paulson with physical violence. Eventually, she delivered the true coup de grace, demanding to speak to the manager. Showing clear reluctance, Paulson agreed and led Agent Blandina to a door near the front of the store. It opened up into an unlit staircase that descended into the darkness below. At the bottom, they found a break room that appeared similar to a bunkhouse in a prisoner of war camp, containing hammock after hammock filled with uncomfortable sleeping employees. Paulson informed Agent Blandina that some of the people who work at the store were once normal civilians who'd been exploited with a number of legal loopholes, and now lived inside the store full-time. Some, for example, had stayed in past closing time, which had resulted in them becoming store property for a minimum of a year. Paulson himself had entered a raffle for an abs transplant, and instead, won servitude at SCP-4703, which he couldn't legally turn down thanks to the powerful anomalous laws of the store. As Paulson and Agent Blandina ventured deeper into the bowels of the staff area, they passed eleven unmarked doors, before finally stopping in front of the twelfth and last one. She opened the door and discovered shelves and stacked boxes within. Agent Blandina expressed incredulity at the idea that the store's manager would be kept inside of a supply closet in the basement, but Paulson insisted that this was indeed the manager's office, and as he did, he pulled a string connected to the ceiling. This caused a wall of boxes to split down the middle like a secret doorway, revealing a large executive chair facing the wall on the other side of the room. Still maintaining the cover story that she just wanted a discount, Agent Blandina pressed on and approached the chair. She spun it around to get a better look at the manager, and found herself standing in front of a desiccated corpse, with no eyes and all of his teeth pulled out, his mouth wrenched open in a permanent, silent scream of terror. Paulson identified this man as Mr. Venatio Haruspice, the manager of SCP-4703. Paulson would have told Agent Blandina that his boss was a corpse earlier, but to do so was against the rules. Agent Blandina sighed and grumbled, I feel like I should have expected this. Paulson assured Agent Blandina that she could still make her complaint though, and the owner of the store would eventually hear it. As Paulson understood it, the body known as the manager acted almost like a kind of telephone, sending messages through to the owner. 
The owner would then reply through faxed messages hidden inside the cereal boxes that acted as the only food source of the staff trapped within. This Kafka-esque nightmare just kept getting worse and worse, but Agent Blandina refused to give up that easily. Agent Blandina asked him to explain the exact nature of the manager's condition to her. Paulson replied, I know that he's legally our manager. I know that he's, well, what he is. I know that one of us always has to kiss him goodnight at closing time. I know that if we tell him something, the owner knows, but the owner seems to know everything that happens here anyway, so I can't be certain that's related. What else? I know that he's empty, or hollow, actually hollow's probably a better word. Agent Blandina leaned in a little further to see what exactly Paulson meant by that, only to make a horrifying discovery. The manager wasn't a whole corpse, he was just desiccated skin, a husk somehow propped up into the shape of a corpse. When Agent Blandina asked why Paulson specified hollow and not empty, he told her that it was because a noise was sometimes heard emanating from within the skin husk. Agent Blandina wisely refused to put her ear anywhere near the manager's gaping, toothless mouth, and instead fed the hidden microphone she had been wearing down into the husk's throat. Before Paulson had time to remark on the strangeness of this, sirens and alarms began going off all around them. Paulson began to panic, yelling that the lions were incoming, and the duo needed to move quickly to get out of harm's way. Luckily, Agent Blandina was able to escape with only minor injuries, but shortly after her escape, SCP-4703's legality was once again restructured to make it illegal for non-employees to enter the employee-only areas. The audio that Agent Blandina recorded inside the body of the manager was also analyzed by experts at the Foundation, and they discovered that, when sped up by 75%, the sound was indistinguishable from human laughter. Due to the highly strange nature of this anomaly and its containment procedures, even by SCP Foundation standards, the classes and designations applied to SCP-4703 are equally strange and complex. Knowledge of the file and the anomaly itself is relatively low tier, with restricted Level 2 access permissions. Due to the immense difficulty in keeping SCP-4703 hidden or contained thanks to its unique legal situation, it has been given the object class Keter. This, however, is where things get even stranger. The SCP-4703 store has a rare secondary object class, Truculent. This classification is likely to be unfamiliar to most, but it is used in the specific situation when an item is unpredictable and often transformative, and the containment measures around it must be consistently updated and evolved in order to meet its containment needs. It has the Level 3 or Kenic Disruption class, meaning that it has a roughly medium potential to cause disruption, though this disruption is likely to be confined to a relatively local area. And finally, it has the Risk class Warning, meaning that it presents a high risk to all who interact with it, complete with the possibility of causing severe harm, including death, though legally due to emissive scent from the law firm working in association with SCP-4703. I am obliged to tell you that it's mainly because the bargains at Yeah We're Totally Going to Sell You This are simply to die for, which is perfectly legal, thank you very much. Now go and watch another entry from the classified files of Dr. Bob, such as SCP-5172, North American Hotel Ice Machines, for another SCP that will make you think twice about visiting common everyday locations. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.